Hello, I'm Richard Lowenberg, and uh, this is Arts and Sciences Telluride 2024, uh, a follow-up to Arts and Sciences Telluride 1979. <laughs> so marking 45 years since uh, uh, this program has happened in the small community, the beautiful community of Telluride, uh, and uh, this time also uh, online. In 1979, we were not online. We didn't even have cell phones. Uh, so uh, let's see. We uh, have had a number of uh, Leonardo laser zoom uh, interactions over the last uh, few days since this past Friday. They've been remarkable. Uh, just uh, I'm overjoyed at the people who said yes to participating in this and to um, uh, meeting with you online. So uh, today we have a program that I've really been looking forward to, and it's called The Sounds and Senses of Life. And uh, just to back up a second, the, the subject of this whole eight-day, uh, 12 laser zoom program is the nature of information. And that has to do with a, a personal bias, a personal interest and obsession, and that has been lifelong an interest in what is the information environment? What is information? It's uh, according to physics, fundamental to the universe. According to biophysics, it's fundamental to the origin of life. Uh, and uh, we as humans are playing very actively in the information environment. And uh, there's a delicate balance as in our material environment that I think is going to be necessary if we really want to pursue uh, our espoused uh, sustainability strategies. Uh, I think uh, uh, a, um, an ecology of the information environment is critical to making decisions about so many other things. And I think we're uh, possibly in trouble. Uh, and I think many of us feel that same concern. So uh, it's a huge subject. We're touching on many issues over uh, the eight day program through this Friday. And today um, we're doing the sounds and senses of life. And the participants on this program uh, are uh, Scott Kildall, in San Francisco, Tim Collins and Reiko Goto in Scotland, Ken Rinaldo in Ohio, Matteo Rini in New York City. I think you're in Brooklyn right now, and uh, you can inform us if not. And uh, and a special guest who's not listed in the program that I uh, uh, very uh, much wanted to invite to participate in this program, and that's John Lifton. And we'll hear more about and by everybody as we proceed. Uh, and hopefully we have a series of presentations and then enough time for dis some discussion. And if uh, you're watching and want to, uh, as I see already, uh, communicate via chat, um, please do so. And we'll try to address some of the chat uh, questions or comments. So to begin, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Scott Kildall, who will uh, ideally introduce himself so that I don't say wrong things. And uh, Scott, take it away. Great. Thank you, everyone. Let me go ahead and get my screen shared over here. I thank Richard and everyone, uh, the staff here, for inviting me and organizing this fantastic conference. Um, I'm a new media artist. I've worked out of San Francisco, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about sensors and soundscapes, which has been the focus of my artwork for the last five or six years. Surrounding us is an invisible layer of natural data. We often can't see, hear, smell, or taste it, but it's there in the form of electrochemical activity in plants, particulates in the air, pollution in the water, and much more. My work lifts the veil into this world using sensors to track such live data and translate it into sculptural sound installations and performances. So human perception is just a small portion of what other, organiz or other organisms sense. Uh, we have a limited number of senses and a limited bandwidth for each of our senses. I wanna go through just a couple of quick case studies. Our, our good friend, the mosquito, starts with sensing carbon dioxide at about 30 feet away. 
it hones in on its prey and then uses infrared heat detectors, sensors, to figure out where to go from there. It also uses uh, sensors that sense volatile organic compounds, odors of humans, which is why some humans are more susceptible to mosquitoes than others. And finally, they have taste receptors on their feet. So when they land on your body, they can tell the difference between you know, some of your clothes and the tasty bits of skin. Another uh, fun predator, uh, a little bit more dangerous, but a lot less um, common uh, for uh, deaths and accidents is the shark. And the shark, like the mosquito, has um, you know, a series of long range sensors down to close range. It starts with hearing at a very low frequencies and is listening to wounded fish in the water. Uh, it goes after wounded fish more than um, active fish, it's easier prey. And then it goes through smell sensors, sensors that sense pressure, pressure waves of pressure in the water, sight. And then finally, which is really great, are these electrical sensors that sense um, the electrical fields of fish. All fish um, have electrical fields and they conduct in water pretty well. So sharks will sense those electrical fields of fish. And that's, um, so the fish can't really hide. They try to hide in the sand, but the sharks will get them. And that's why the hammerhead shark is shaped the way it is. It's kind of like this giant, you know, metal detector electrical sensor. Um, and that's why the body is shaped that way. So I want to ask you, everyone here, to sort of step outside of yourself and imagine being another organism entirely. And think about this. Our concept of reality is entirely mediated by human biology. Our eyes, our ears, our sense of touch, and so on. For example, color isn't real. Reality is trillions and trillions of photons oscillating at different wavelengths. It's our brain and our eyesight that constructs this vast tapestry of colors that we see, but most other organisms don't have that amazing eyesight. So this is what I'm excited about these days, technically, is that electronic sensors are now low cost and can tap into this invisible set of data that other organisms can sense. Um, the carbon dioxide center, this is a pretty high-end one. Uh, it costs about $70. This air quality sensor, one that I use in my installations, costs only $40. And this rain sensor is about $10. And this is one that is um, very similar to what a lot of insects can sense with their, um, on their bodies. And what I do is I use existing sensors, off the shelf ones, or build my own. I augment them with circuitry to develop custom boards, circuit boards that collect this data. I filter it with software and transmit it wirelessly. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology. This is an ESP32 chip that I can get for about five or $6. And it's kind of like an Arduino on steroids. It does Wi-Fi, 32-bit architecture. The point is that the, 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 the circuitry is cheap. So it's easy for me to develop a lot of these boards and I don't have to spend a lot of money doing it. It's affordable for artists. Kind of like you know, video art became accessible to artists in the 70s. Um, electronic art is now really super cheap to do. And these are a number of sensors that I have, I've de developed. This is the air quality sensor that tracks particulates, um, PN10s, 2.5, PN1.0, using laser scatter techniques. This is an off-the-shelf sensor, and I've uh, built out a nice own circuit board that does a display and so on. Um, I also have an infrared light sensor that grabs um, infrared light at several specific frequencies and pipes in those four channels of data. This is what I call a mycelium sensor, which is just really an analog resistance sensor, and it uses two probes inserted into mycelium to get their electrical activity. And this is one I just developed this week with a colleague of mine. I called an Airstream sensor. We attach sensors to a glider, and that tracks flight telemetry, like altitude, direction, roll, and gravity, kind of like a bird. So like a bird might experience these things. And then what I do is I map this invisible data, at least to humans, into soundscapes uh, they're either sculptural or performances. This one was one that I did called the AQ, AQ Sound Bath, Air Quality Sound Bath. I did this for the Bombay Beach Biennial about a year and a half ago. And it's a sound bath that modulates percussive beats um, based on air quality. And the reason I chose sound is sound is immediate, it's shared, it's non-directed. Um, and unlike vision where you, know, you have artworks that you can look at and have these individual experiences, you have these experiences of communal kind of activity. And the first of two videos I'm going to show you that um, are about recent works is going to be one called Infrared Reflections. And I did this at the Joshua Tree National Park residency. I just finished this work in May of 2024 this year. And it's a sonification of near infrared light from the Joshua Tree. And the video runs about two minutes long.
And that whole soundtrack um, was from the live recording. I didn't remix it anywhere else. So, um, and so that, that's what I try to do is I create the live performances and the results are something on SoundCloud that I can then remix and some video. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technology because you know there are science folks here. And I'm, for all of these installations, I developed this data sensing architecture. And so I use OSC, Open Sound Control, which is a protocol that's built on top of UDP, a, a networking protocol that transmits data over Wi-Fi. And the pathway for development for some of these um, installations right now, the one that's sort of favored is that I sense the data, I feed them into this microcontroller chip, I transmit it via OSC, I then pick it up in Touch Designer, which is a, you know, an application on, um, on my Mac, and then send out those instrument data out to Ableton, which is a software synthesizer program that's very powerful. This is not the only pathway. Um, I've also done ones where I sense the data, I transmit it via OSC, and I have sort of a one-to-many relationship where I have other microchips that microcontrollers that pick up that data and send it out to like synths written in C++. And this is an installation that does that. I'm not going to show the video for this, but this these are like these um, small little sound chips that produce much more primitive sound. Um, but they don't require a laptop. So, but the point here is that this data architecture is very flexible and a lot of different types of applications can use them. And what's also been really helpful for this is that um, I've been able to do data logging with it, which is really helpful, hopefully for scientists as well. And if um, there's scientists in the audience, we can talk about collaborations, but this means that I can set up a system where I have uh, dispersed sensors and I can log the data and this, I can get resolution up to 15 milliseconds or so and get these really nice graphs that show me a bit more about what kind of um, data expressions are happening with the sensors and I can figure out where to go from them. So this architecture supports rapid development of new projects. In the last four months, I've been able to complete three new sound installations slash performances in just four months, which is amazing um, because as folks know who work with art and technology, building out the tool set and platform often takes a huge amount of time. So it's been just amazing to have a chance to just work on the concepts and the materials. And the next one I wanna show you is an installation called Fungitopia. I did this in originally in April at, at the Bombay Beach Biennial. And then I did a final version of this over at a local gallery here in San Francisco called Four Chicken Gallery. And this creates ambient music from mycelium electrical signals. And for those of you in the audience who aren't you know, familiar with what mycelium is compared to mushrooms, mycelium is a root-like structure of fungus consisting of a mass of branching thread-like hyphae, essentially a neural network for fungi. And, um, and then they may or may not have mushrooms. So if there's mushrooms, there's mycelium that are you know, sprouting the mushrooms, but you can have mycelium without mushrooms. Last November, I read about this paper um, written by, or the study uh, conducted by Dr. Andrew Adamansky who is a scientist working out of Britain, who found that fungi seem to transmit information using electrical impulses across their filaments. And upon deeper uh, reading of it, he suggested that 
and has experimented with mycelium and seems to suggest that mycelium have about 50 words, like essentially electrical impulse, impulses, kind of like phonemes, organized into senses, into sentences, and these are the ways they communicate. And of course, we can't understand what they're saying because it's not going to be in any sort of human you know, kind of language. But I was inspired by this. And although I can't replicate the exact experiment because I don't have the scientific, scientific tools and the methodologies, I used that based that the paper as a basis for creating this installation called Fungitopia. And so once again, this is another two minute video and I'll go ahead and play it. And so with this project and, and with some of my readings in general, I've been looking for a redefinition of intelligence. I've been reading more and more um, papers about this. And there are the classic sort of definition of intelligence or consciousness is the mirror test, which involves um, whether or not animals recognize their reflection in the mirror. And it's, it's sort of a funny flawed test because humans are already kind of, they, they suppose they're at the top of the pyramid and then they design a test to, to fit the conditions for how humans might perceive and view the world, and then they apply it to other animals and classify them as a result. So it's, it's a, obviously a pretty biased test. Uh, and, and some animals, like for example, dogs don't do so well on the mirror test because they don't, they don't see very well. So they're not really looking at the reflection. If they could smell the reflection, they would probably pass this. Um, other animals, certain monkeys don't even care about mirrors. They just look at the mirrors and they just forget to see themselves if they wanted to, but they don't want to play the game. And I've also been looking at, um, you know, intelligence in terms of how animals might communicate. So recently there's been discoveries around um, humpback whales have their own language and we've been able to decode that language with the help of AI tools. Um, elephants also have used vo like low level vocalizations and movement of their bodies to uh, communicate with each other. And apparently they have names, they, have, they recognize each other by names. And then also, like, how do animals survive? So uh, an uh, animals such as ants may not be intelligent by themselves, but they certainly have a swarm intelligence and they've certainly dominated our world and are in our houses. And um, you could argue that they're a more intelligent species than humans. Also, we kind of wonder, do microbes just rule the world? They're in our guts. They're going to go to space along with us and are we their vessels? And so what's next for some of the work I'm doing? Um, I want to focus on doing a few new projects this fall and in the spring looking at water um, water quality, sonar detection and mapping through custom vessels, soil health, that which affects many, many organisms and invisible communication of various animals. Like bats are a very good example of ultrasonic communication. And yeah, that's my work. And um, feel free to contact me at one of these mechanisms here. And I'm super looking forward to hearing what everyone else has to present and say today. Thank you.
Bravo. Thank you very much, Scott. That was a great opening presentation. We're going to move right away to uh, Reiko Goto and uh, Tim Collins. Uh, and uh, I, I'm going to mostly be very brief here. So I'm just turning it over to uh, Tim and Reiko. Surprise us. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. That was quite amazing to see what you've been up to. We're going to just give you a, a limited sense of, of what we do and how we do it. Um, everything's kind of long term, um, rather slow. Um, we're not hackers and technologists per se, but we work with hackers and technologists. Uh, we work with scientists, we work with philosophers, we work with a whole range of people to refine what both the what and why of what we're doing. So on the top left is uh, Reiko um, sitting um, in our, in our uh, house uh, in the Midlands of England. Uh, a couple of years after we'd left Carnegie Mellon University, where we were working on post-industrial public space and ecological restoration. Uh, we'd been, uh, as that project was wrapping up, we were looking at long-term ecological research and we got interested in plant physiology and Reiko had done some work at, back in California with uh, 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 the, the Marin um, uh, Wildlife uh, Center where um, she took care of birds, mammals, a whole range of critters. And part of that was paying attention to their breath. So as we finished up landscape-based ecological work, we started to think that we wanted to dig down a little bit. So we spent a couple of years fooling around with off-the-shelf technology to figure out how we might measure photosynthesis and transpiration in tree leaves. So this on the top left, this is Reiko with the first system set up it took us about three months to get it up and running. We had a, a professor of plant physiology come in and take a look at it. Um, he had his doubts as to whether we had it working properly, but he was quite pleased with what he saw. And he eventually invited us into his soil lab where we had access to uh, oh, climate controlled uh, rooms that would allow us to keep trees in um, leaf. 365 days a year. And we could, so with this, we start producing data. That's all we're doing. Uh, we start to sonify it, very simple sonification. We start to work with some musicians to help us think about what that means. But what we really wanted was real time um, sound in relationship to data output. And we were able to achieve that by hacking some existing systems while working in the soil lab. Uh, that led to the development of plain air, which is in the top right, which is basically a, a painting easel that's filled with similar equipment um, that measures um, a photosynthesis transpiration through temperature, humidity, light, uh, airflow, carbon dioxide in a leaf sensor and then compares it to atmospheric conditions using the same set of sensors. And then there's a logarithm, uh, standard uh, plant physiology logarithm that gives us photosynthesis and transpiration. And the gentleman on the right is Chris Malcolm, who's become a, a, a dear friend of ours. And Chris was the first uh, musician we'd work. Everything's iterative, everything takes years to get right. Chris was the first musician that showed up and wanted to work on this. And the first thing he did was he says, I'm gonna write a baseline for photosynthesis. And then I'm gonna write a baseline for transpiration. And he'd bring it into the studio on a Sunday in Reiko and he and I would sit and listen for a couple hours. And Chris would be like, oh, I gotta do this again. This isn't right. So I tease him that he's kind of a jazz musician. He writes code as if it were a riff that he brings and basically tries to build it from the from the data out, from the plant out. And what he's looking for is some relationship to the changing environmental conditions as it's represented by the life forces of the plant itself. And this is all part of an ongoing discourse and agreement. So plain air uh, 
went through four iterations. It was eventually uh, shown in Europe, in the US. Um, we have a plein air album that's on Bandcamp. Um, so it was a, a pretty successful project, a lot of work, a lot of time and money went into it, um, but an interesting process. But probably more importantly, it's an interesting practice. It's about being with otherness. It's about, it's, it's a means for us to think about relationships with trees over the long term. Uh, on the bottom left, you see the, the next iteration, which began in 2022. We, we realized the limitations of plain air, which were it required some kind of a physical space to work within that protected it from the elements. That glass house in Glasgow was a particularly dynamic place uh, uh, to be using that particular instrument. But we wanted to take it out into the landscape. So this is the first uh, first year of Hakoto. We're uh, at a uh, music festival. And Reiko and I are wearing uh, a pair of Hakoto. we thinking about a climate duet. Um, as you can see, in everything we do, the technology is not visible. Um, what we want people to do is pay attention to the sound as it relates to the environmental condition and the, the plant's response to those conditions. So what we can see in here is actually being produced in real time in relationship, uh, in a generative relationship to the data that's flowing. Um, I'm, we're gonna go forward now at this point and we're gonna just give you a quick sense. We've got a five minute video where Reiko explains uh, the function of a, um, uh, a new effort where we've gone from tree leaves to bog plants in Ireland. Uh, then we'll go back to some of the tree leaf work and we'll just show you the evolution of the current work over the last year and a half. So I'm just gonna start this video and just, this is a really nice overview of work that we've just completed two weeks ago. My name is Reiko Goto Collins and our project is called Hakoto Ota Bog. Between 2019 and 20, uh, Tim and I were uh, invited for an artist in residence program. We were uh, researching about Rahbora Sculpture Park. And after, uh, Tim and I were very interested in living bogs in other parts of Ireland. We were thinking about observing different bogs with um, sound sculpture, body instrument called Hakoto. It is designed for uh, listening to a tree leaf, but uh, Tim and I thought we could redevelop a part of the sculpture for listening to sphagnum bog asphodel and then bog cotton heather so on. We have a team, Chris Malcolm, computer and then sound programmer, and Jim Watt, engineer and artist, and then Brea Thompson, uh, another engineer and artist. We asked to develop semi-sphere cup to hold about 10 centimeter diameter of bog, uh, and then also it's attached to a a uh, walking stick that holds uh, also the sensor. Sensor of light, intensity, temperature, measuring the carbon dioxide and humidity. And that's attached to the backpack. That's also uh, hold another set of sensor that measure um, atmospheric conditions. And then a small computer in the backpack calculate photosynthesis 
and then transpiration of the swagma changed to sound so people could hear layers of data goes up and down and then also rhythms how fast the, the uh, photosynthesis is going or transpiration is going. The instruments were chosen based on Japanese ancient music called gagaku, which is not really melodical, but we felt that is very close to the previous uh, our experience of um, plant sound. Fruit that represent uh, photosynthesis, and then also uh, viwa, the string uh, instrument, that sound represent transpiration. And then also variable um, sizes of drums, that represent how fast activity of the sphagma uh, physiological data is going. Finding uh, the bogs around here, that was, we couldn't do it by ourselves. <laughs> We talked to a few people, and then they gave us really good recommendations. So six blanket fog sites were identified uh, through uh, talking to many people. Each site, we spent about 20 minutes for recording. And then um, I also uh, developed uh, how Hakoto looks like in the landscape. So an image, a person who is uh, carrying a backpack and then a walking stick to wander around the landscape. So that image had to be developed. Oh, okay. So Hakoto means leaf word saying. It uh, is just the sound documentation of a black locust tree in the Shiros Park, uh, uh, Stamheim, from um, middle of the recording. Uh, you may hear a thunder and then we change the sound. Uh, the, this image is, uh, these images show Hakoto speaking leaf at the Glasgow Women's Library uh, in June 2024. Uh, this work was developed for the Glasgow International. Uh, I designed the fruit tree garden. The garden is shared with Yoko Ono, and then she entitled uh, Peace Arbor. Uh, Beside the fruit trees, I brought eight native trees, uh, oak, hawthorn, beech, birch, rowan, hazel, aspen, and then pine. Um, and Yoko Ono relied on these trees for her work called Wish Trees. Um, so the performance, um, hold on, um, uh, I performed four times. Uh, each performance was about 20 minutes. 
the audience could hear uh, seven different trees. And then uh, um, it's, it's very difficult to show because people could hear the difference in each tree, but very hard to articulate. However, the light changes, uh, temperature changes. Uh, we are in we were in the shared um, environment. That was really important. Not just to recording the sound. The audience had to be in the in the place. So you can see in the um, in the top line, you can see the the wrist uh, system and the uh, plant leaf. And uh, also in the third image on the bottom on the right, um, which is, um, hold on, why is it? Let me change. Um, which is recreated as a bog tool um, in August of last year. So here we are at Clara Bog, a restored bog in the Midlands, and then at a bog just south of Sligo which is a vast bog that was actually never harvested and uh, quite a spectacular place to be. Um, just to give you a sense of the evolution, so Hakoto has shifted from the bird box containers to these uh, more traditional box life backpacks, uh, two different ones, one with the Chinese sign for a tree and the other one with the with a, uh, a vertical uh, Scottish flag on the right, you can see the 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 um, uh, the wrist monitor actually fits in the larger box. On the bottom, you can see some of the details from the development of the Hakoto bog system and actually the bog structure at the end. And with that, we're done. Thank you so much for your time and your patience. I think we're about a minute and a half over. <laughs> no, you've got lots of time yet. <laughs> we loved it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, and I know there's going to be a, a, an enjoyable discussion uh, toward the latter part of this program. So let's just move things along. Um, and uh, let's see. Let's invite Ken Rinaldo. Here he comes. Yes. You're on, Ken. Thank wow. you. Hello, hello, everybody. OK, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. OK, great. Uh, I'm Ken Rinaldo. I'm a retired professor from The Ohio State University Art and Technology Area, and now, hooray, a full-time artist, maker, and inventor. And my work focuses primarily on what I would call hybrid ecologies involving uh, animals, robots, algorithms, plants, and bacteria, and using art uh, to explore and amplify the symbiotic relationships within ecosystems. I'm also really excited with this theme of the sounds and senses of life, as so many of my works involve sonic elements and are focused on the nature of sound in delivering an experience and a work of art and also amplifying and allowing others to appreciate the delicate beauty of life, both natural life, artificially intelligent life forms, and genetically manipulated life forms in hopes of saving plant species. I'll present a couple of projects which engage these ideas. The Opera for Dying Insects is an AI-driven installation that showcases the life and environmental roles of pill bugs in an insect, soil, and bacterial ecosystem. It is concerned with the insect apocalypse we are in the middle of at the present time. The project features live video projections and AI mixed operatic sounds. And it highlights the ecological, ecological significance and the extinction threats of insects, emphasizing the importance of these creatures in our ecosystems. Here is a system running the insect recognition software on a Mac Mini. And here it is actually functioning. And I'll let the video uh, take it from here. Perhaps one of the greatest tragedies of our time is the recent realization that we are in the middle of an insect apocalypse. 
resulting from industrialized farming, habitat loss, global warming, deforestation, and synthetic pesticide use. 73 separate studies estimate that insects have declined by 41% since scientists have been tracking their populations. In 2017, a 27-year-long population monitoring study revealed a 76% decline in flying insects alone. Insects are disappearing by 2.5% yearly, and 40% of insect species are near extinction. As insects comprise the base of the food chain for other species, such as birds, this is a truly global tragedy that has implications for the food chain beyond human food systems. For humans, three quarters of our crops depend on insect pollination. Living isopods, or pill bugs, are voicing this tragedy through their activities in this biorobotic artwork, the opera for dying insects. The opera remix is composed as they slowly eat, deconstruct, and reproduce in their green vitrine, a protected paradise of moist mosses. The isopod's movements are sensed with AI software, and the video is analyzed to determine their location, number, and speed of movement. As music evokes deep emotional responses, tragic opera seems the ideal way to help humans understand the global tragedy before us. When this work is installed, people can observe the living environment and large live images projected onto the wall of the installation to reveal this micro world at a scale equivalent to our own. These videos are mixed with videos of industrial farming, pesticide use, and other industrial processes decimating insects globally. This work invites us to notice the subtlety and the beauty of all insects, as well as ancient isopods. As isopods have survived multiple global extinction events, they are the ideal musical activators of this tragic opera. With this biorobotic installation, we may also realize that a catastrophic collapse of nature's ecosystems will mean unprecedented human hunger and perhaps our own extinction. The next work I'd like to show you is a work considered artificial life. It also involves sound. It's called Fusiform Polyphony or face music. And it's a series of six robotic sculptures commissioned by Nuit Blanche in Toronto. And they auto compose music with input from participants' facial images. This is considered an emergent form of artificial life artwork. Micro video cameras on the tips of these soft robots covered in human hair move toward people's faces while capturing human snapshots. These images are digitally processed, pixelated, and they're turned into a constantly evolving generative soundscape where facial features turn these images into abundant sound, melodies, and rhythm. These robots take the multicultural makeup of any city and have each person's unique look create a different soundscape. Each face song combines with other facial soundscapes and makes an overall sonic human robot experiences. These works explore new morphologies of soft robotics, an emerging field where soft skins and gentle software code allow these robots to have an artificial sense of their environment and be approachable and friendly. Here is another view of one of the screens receiving a facial image and some of that data being parsed. The questions I'm asking are how can artificial intelligence be scripted to compose and play back a unique and constantly evolving generative soundscape while maintaining and enhancing the viewer's experience.
Fusiform polyphony is a series of six interactive robotic Fusiform polyphony is a series of six interactive robotic sculptures that compose their own music with input from participant facial images. Micro video cameras mounted on the ends of these robots move toward people's body heat and faces while capturing human snapshots. These images are digitally processed, pixelated, and produce constantly evolving generative soundscapes where facial features and interaction are turned into sound, melody, tone, and rhythm. These elements fused manifest the viewer as participant, actor, and conductor in defining new ways of interacting with robots and allow the robots to safely interact with humans in complex and natural environments. An important element of this installation is to see self through the robot's artificial eyes as each robot tracks and captures images in the process of showing the nature of algorithmic robotic vision. These works are covered in human hair and explore new morphologies of soft robotics and emerging field where natural materials make the works approachable and friendly. The hair serves to point to a human robotic hybrid moment in our own evolution where the intelligence of robots is more fully fusing with our own. The live camera-based video of the robots is processed through Max MSP and Jitter and projected to the periphery of the installation on five screens. When the robot is at head height, a sensor at the tip of the robot is triggered and a facial snapshot is taken. The snapshot is held in the small area of the projected screen to the upper right. That snapshot is broken down into 300 pixel grid and variations of red, green and blue data of each pixel is extracted and interfaced to Max MSP and Jitter and to Ableton Live which selects the musical sample determining rhythm, tempo and dynamics. Changing pixel data constantly changes Ableton virtual instrument selection sets with random seeds coming from the snapshots. The robotic structure so I'll move on to the next piece. Uh, the next piece I'd like to show is a piece called CRISPR Seed Resu Resurrection. In 2010, a Russian team found a seed cache of Silene stenophylla at 124 feet, 38 meters below the permafrost. Stenophylla is a flowering plant native to Siberia that an Ice Age squirrel had buried near the banks of the Kolmia River. Radiocarbon data confirmed that the seeds were 32,000 years old. It, astounded, it astounds me to this day that the DNA from the seeds and evolved biological ability of the seeds to bloom so far into the future really gives me hope for our global warming moment. CRISPR seed resurrection is a project that uses the evolved nature of seeds as a structural guide to creating new seed containers to help seeds survive longer so that they may bloom in a distant future. It also uses our newfound understanding of how bacteria have taught us lessons on how to edit the DNA of viruses and then apply this knowledge to editing the DNA of seeds in the process called CRISPR-Cas9 or Cas12. It also features a narrative song about CRISPR meant to stimulate dialogue about the promises and the dangers, the real dangers of CRISPR done as a sonic remix polyphonic song. Because of course it was commissioned by Marta de Menezes in Portugal, it needed to include a polyphonic choral music of a, a composer, Duarte Lobo, as well with Fado remixes. Fado, by the way, is kind of like the jazz of Portugal and a song about the tragedies of biological diversity loss in plants and their seeds. And here's a close up of one of the rapid prototyped seeds. It's enlarged to show people the details of the seed containers. CRISPR and X-ray and or chemical mutagenic methods will be used to transform the seeds and these are common. Here's some flowers that we have now, but we may not have in the future. And here is a 3D model of a, a duck eating the seeds, these artificially produced seeds. As many of you know, uh, birds are uh, thoroughly involved in spreading seeds around the planet. 
fact, many seeds won't even bloom unless they move through the digestive system of certain animals. And uh, there's also a proposal to distribute some of these seeds via airplanes, although it certainly is a heavy carbon um, uh, solution. Part of the installation also is to show the process of editing the genes uh, using CRISPR. So here are some 3D visualizations, which are at the top of the piece. And these are presented in a kind of cinematic metaverse uh, at the top of the image above the mallard duck. And they show the DNA being modified in the CRISPR process. And um, the genetic traits that will be modified in the CRISPR process are fairly uh, complex. So I'm not gonna share them here. But I would like to show you what the piece looks like overall uh, at the exhibition. And um, let me see if I could play a song uh, of what the song is. So only when you stand in front of the work will the song be activated. Inside the beaker are little humans spinning around with car parts and bits of human garbage. Acidifying, warming up, our ocean body steams, our forests are burning, and so are our dreams. We endow a sophistication of bacteria fighting a virus. Genes changed will rearrange, allowing you to teach us. We annotate and assemble DNA of future seeds that may, if we need, bloom, boom, and succeed. We can use evolution to So um, before I move on, what I, I would like to say is that uh, the sound in this piece is only activated when you stand in front of it. Uh, for anybody who has um, had to sit through an exhibition where sound repeats itself forever, it of course drives uh, curators and uh, docents crazy. So in this case, I just uh, think it's important to mention that the song is only activated when you stand in front of it thereby activating the, um, the work of art itself. And the last piece I'd like to show you is a collaborative piece. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, um, I'm really interested in not only um, amplifying natural living systems, but also finding possible solutions for how we will feed ourselves on this planet. And the last work I'd like to show you is a collaborative project by myself and um, Amy Young's my wife. And it's basically a solution, but it also has sound and you'll see it here. Farm Fountain is a sculpture for growing edible and ornamental fish and plants in a constructed indoor ecosystem. Based on the concept of aquaponics, this hanging garden uses a pump, along with gravity, to flow the nutrients from fish waste through the plant roots. The plants and bacteria in the system serve to cleanse and purify the water for the fish. This project is an exploration of local, sustainable agriculture and recycling. As we researched this work, we were astonished to learn that our food travels an average of 1,500 miles from farm to fork. So we originally developed our custom aquaponic system as a way to grow fresh food in our home, even in the winter. The system recycles two liter plastic bottles as planters and continuously cycles the water in the system to create a symbiotic relationship between edible plants, fish, and humans. Every four minutes, we pump the water from the bottom of the fish tank through clear tubing, leading to the top tier of the bottles, where gravity takes over and the water cascades through each of the bottles, emptying into the main fish tank.
This 250 gallon tank is separated into two zones. At the top where the fish reside, we constantly filter the suspended solids in the water to keep it clear. This bottom zone is where the water is drawn up and pumped to the top of the plant containers. Each planter contains hydrogen balls, a hydroponics media made of clay. As the waste-laden water enters the hydrogen balls, the natural nitrogen cycle is allowed to take its course, establishing colonies of nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. This process converts the toxic ammonia in fish waste into beneficial nitrogen compounds that are then absorbed by the plants as fertilizer. The work creates an indoor, healthy environment that also provides oxygen and light to the humans moving through the space. The sound of water trickling through the plant containers creates a peaceful, relaxing waterfall. The fish that are a part of this project also provide a focus for relaxed viewing. The plants we are currently growing include lettuces, microgreens, cilantro, mint, basil, chives, parsley, rosemary, and curry. In other versions of this work, we are growing tilapia fish, which are edible and delicious. Many varieties of fish can be grown in this way, including perch, crayfish, and goldfish, which are seen in this version. Each grow light is a low-power LED bulb, which only uses 4 watts of energy, so our complete lighting system with 100 bulbs allows the possibility of powering the system with solar panels. The bulbs are specific frequencies providing the light spectrum the plants need to flourish. We are interested in the potential to inspire others to make their own version of the farm fountain, so we created an illustrated how-to page online to share our designs. We hope others will join this dialogue and help evolve the possibilities for local, indoor aquaculture. And that completes my presentation, and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Inspiring. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm trying not to take up too much time. Uh, otherwise, I'd throw more compliments everybody's way. Uh, but uh, right now, let's switch over to Matteo Rini. Matteo is, uh, well, he'll introduce himself a bit, but Matteo is involved in some real art, science, cross-disciplinary involvement. So take it away, Matteo. I uh, thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm just so humbled to be part of this. Uh, it's quite incredible what you all have shown. Um, it's really rare to meet a sort of marriage between science and art that is so profound, and I'm impressed by both the quality of you produce artistically, but also how much you master the science and technology that, that you need for that. Um, and so I'm, I'm the physicist here. So I start with a actually a physics slide, but I can promise it's gonna be only two slides and I'll go back to talk about sounds of nature. Um, and this is a, a project that, um, Unfortunately, is at a very early stage, and there is a pretty sad reason for that. I was working with two scientists um, who worked on recording, interpreting um, the sound of animals. Um, two very prominent scientists, and both of them passed away in the in the last year. Um, and our idea was to work on a a project that basically uses art and music in particular uh, to make people listen and to make people think about the sounds of our world, the sounds of nature in particular. Listening to sound means uh, paying attention, means slowing down. Um, one thing that appeared to me uh, from, from what they're doing is um, that they were using, uh, so these two scientists are Karen Becker, um, and Gianni Pavan, um, and they were both very interested in um, using sound to protect the environment. So both to decipher what's wrong with the environment and also to devise strategy to, to protect it. 
And so our goal working together was to find artistic and storytelling ways uh, to tell some of the stories that scientists are discovering this year. So a lot of these discoveries are very recent, just a few years ago. Um, and to make people think about the fact that sound, um, every sound that you hear has somehow a reason to be. Um, very often it's very deliberate, um, contains a lot of information that we can read, decipher, um, and use. Um, and so we really wanted to make people think about that. Uh, and, and our idea was to work with a um, group of talented improvisational singers that would sort of interpret nature sound and render them um, in a very sort of improvisational way. Um, this hasn't happened yet, but I would like to share with you some of the stories that I've um, heard from the scientists and uh, some of the sounds that um, I'm sure will intrigue some of you. Some of them may be well known and others less. Um, and I, I like to start with this slide because there is a strange connection between physics, astronomy in particular, and biology, which is that um, for centuries, we didn't pay a lot of attention to sound. Uh, we paid attention to our vision. We look at a universe, we look at animals, we look at nature, we make movies, and that's the way we learn about, about these entities. Um, but things are shifting a bit because of a number of reasons. Um, there are new technologies uh, that allow us to record sound uh, and, and very importantly, AI and machine learning tools that allow us to interpret sound, recognize patterns, and decipher meaning, find meaning in sound. So what you're seeing here in this slide um, are two black holes that rotate um, around each other. Um, and um, basically they swallow each other and they transform into a larger, heavier black hole. This is a discovery of just a couple of years ago. It was probably the most important discovery of the century in physics. It was a confirmation of, basically it's a confirmation of really that black holes exist, although everybody expected that. But it's also a confirmation of Einstein's theory uh, when a very large body moves, it sends out waves um, that basically perturb space time. And what happens is that um, if you plug this signal, this waves into an amplifier, that's what you hear. So basically, what happens is that when two black holes rotate around each other and they get closer and closer, the frequency of, of the waves they emit, um, they, it goes higher and higher. So it's what's called chirping. It's like a bird's chirp. It goes higher and higher. And, and those sounds that you were listening here, uh, those whoop, whoop, they're just the final phase of the merger of two black holes. And, um, so now we can listen to the universe and there are a number of incredibly profound discovery about how the universe began. Um, we also, I think it was this year or last year, um, we heard for the first time the humming of supermassive giant, many billions of times the mass of the sun, black holes, they rotate against each other and they produce this constant background. And with the right detectors, I don't go into how they detect the sound. So basically you can listen to that and learn a lot about how um, the universe began. Um, and, and so this, this trend in science is sort of counterintuitive. You know, before there was radio and then there were movies. Before there were sounds, they're easier. They require less bandwidth. They, you know, they're easier to transmit. And then, you know, video came and video killed the radio stars as the song went. Um, so in science, there was sort of an opposite trend. We're going back to sound and starting to listen. And as I said, uh, machine learning and a number of technology to record different kinds of sound were very instrumental in, 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 uh, in, uh, in, in starting this kind of activities. Um, and the, the overwhelming feeling that I got listening, I interviewed many, many scientists working in different fields, trying to put this project together um, and is that um, every sound 
really has a reason to be. You're there sitting in a forest, sitting in a park, um, and you think there are just some insects play, singing some songs or, or making some sounds, and, and you realize that every detail, every frequency, every modulation of that sound is trying somehow to convey some, some information. And um, I'd like to start by playing, um, coming back from the cosmos to nature, by playing a very interesting sound. This was a discovery that was just um, last summer, last year. You're hearing this sort of, sounds like popcorn popping, this kind of clicks. And um, these are the sounds recorded by um, a group of um, scientists in Tel Aviv University. And uh, basically, these are the sounds that are made by tomato and tobacco plants when they are stressed, when they are dehydrated, when they don't have enough water. Um, this is a, a field that I talked to, to one of the scientists who's working on that. And it's a very controversial field uh, to just say that plants can perceive sounds, like plant can, can make sound. There, there are a lot of debates in how you interpret this. Um, that professor said, you know, I, I did it because I got tenure. I wouldn't have done it before. Um, but basically, examples like this, it's unclear how tomatoes make that sound, although um, it's uh, likely the bursting of some water bubbles. Um, and uh, the sound is pretty loud. It's the only trick that you have to do to listen to that sound is just to transpose the frequency to our audible range, but nothing more than that. And the sound is actually as loud as some human conversation. So it's, it's a pretty loud noise. And some you know, press headlines were describing it as tomatoes scream when they're stressed. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, this is a bit too much, maybe. Uh, it's, it's very hard to argue that tomatoes are uh, feeling something and, and, and screaming, but certainly the sounds are there. They've been they've been proven and they suggest that plants are not really the silent and passive players that we might think they are. Um, we know that plants interact a lot with the environments through chemicals and, and other means and it makes only sense that they use it doing sound as well. Sound is easier to produce, uh, it travels fast, um, it's easier to produce than some chemicals. Um, and there is a growing evidence that plants can sort of manipulate a new sound. And there's a, a pretty stunning experiment where um, they show that some flowers and plants, when they hear the buzzing of bees, so you play the buzzing of bees to them, um, they produce nectar um, as a response to that sound. So there seems to be some sort of interaction and interplay and uh, I guess there's still an open question on whether plants really do interact with their environment, with the animal species that are around them. Um, and again, it's a very controversial field. A lot of people are maybe very skeptical that um, plants have some deliberation on this. Uh, but certainly, you cannot deny that the sounds are there. You cannot deny, again, through AI, they have associated very clearly the sounds with it specific um, condition, just dehydration for this kind of plants. Um, and uh, um, there, there, you know, there are other scientists who are studying interesting interactions. This, for instance, plants that are trying to communicate to their pollinators through sound and tell them this is the right time to pollinate. Um, another very interesting uh, activity regards coral reefs. I'm just playing this for maybe 30 seconds. Sorry. If you listen carefully to that sound, um, it contained a lot of things. And I think mostly it was uh, gurgling from fish and snapping from some shrimp. Um, and uh, people started to record the sound of coral reef. Um, and what they found is that basically there is a big difference between a healthy coral reef and uh, a coral reef that's bleached or uh, is, is sort of losing uh, its biodiversity. Um, and uh, uh, it's, of course, a very important question. Coral reefs are you know, 
uh, the habitat of 25% of, of um, marine species um, and uh, thinking about their health, uh, which of course is going to be impacted very deeply by climate change and ocean acidification is, is, is a very important uh, problem. Um, and it's one of the things that this sounds that the scientists found is that um, coral larvae, which are very simple being, and people didn't think they were capable of hearing sound. But what's happening is that they are attracted to a healthy coral reef. They can distinguish the coral reef where they came from, and they tend to move towards a healthy coral reef versus a non-healthy coral reef. Um, it is pretty intriguing uh, just from the biological point of view to understand how coral larvae can perceive sound, um, but also suggest some mitigation strategies. And I think scientists are already working on that. Um, by playing sounds, you can basically attract coral larvae to, the, to, a, to a, a coral reef that's actually uh, damaged, and you can try to sort of um, repair it or get you know, more coral larvae back to it and, and try to improve its its condition. Um, and, uh, you know, this is just another example um, of the amount of information containing sound. So this is a um, the sound of, of the rainforest. And uh, uh, there are, if you listen carefully to it, okay, there, you need a lot of, um, you know, probably need to listen to this uh, for, for a longer time, but basically, what you're hearing here is um, a, a series of frequencies and from, from very low to very high frequencies, uh, sometimes beyond what we uh, can hear as humans. Um, and uh, one of the um, things that scientists realize is there is this thing called the, um, the, so the ecological niche or the acoustic niche hypothesis that basically tells that um, if you take an environment, species evolve to try to occupy specific bandwidth, specific frequencies, and uh, and not in you know not disturb each other. So if you are an insect or a cicada or birds or um, other types of insects uh, active during the day rather than during night, so they basically they are allocating pretty much like you do in our telephone um, assignments of bandwidth, they, they allocate or evolution led them to allocate their frequencies so they can have their preferred channel of communication. And this kind of studies has turned out to be a very important diagnostic for the health of a forest. People go and monitor forests and sounds. Um, and at some point when you hear that a certain range of frequency has disappeared, it almost invariably tells you that um, something is going on. And uh, a lot of times there is, you realize that there is some sort of environmental damage that's happening um, that basically is, is reducing the biodiversity and the associated sound. So it's an important monitoring um, technique that can warn biologists and ecologists about degradation in a specific environment. Um, and it's it's a tool that's that's really being used um, increasingly to to diagnose a force, but also to assess mitigation and, and reparation strategies. Basically, you can record a spectrum following a certain intervention, a certain attempt to repopulate um, a certain environment, and, and basically see if you recover the full spectrum of frequencies or not. Um, I will go very sorry. Again, I'll go very quickly through this too. You know, you probably have heard a lot about whale sounds. Um, to me, it was the the reason to to start this project. Um, it basically, um, sorry, uh, the, the the sounds of whale are the sounds that I used to play during the pandemics when. Um, I come from Italy and I came from the epicenter of the pandemics uh, after, after China. Um, my family really had a lot of losses due to then. And I, when the pandemic started, I, I stopped sleeping. I couldn't sleep. And, um, and at some point I found this record, um, the song of, of the humpback whale um, that was published in the seventies by um, Patty Payne and her husband. Um, and uh, 
I, I read through that story and um, I don't have time to go through this, but it's really impressive how Katie in particular was trying to listen to whales, understand um, what their sounds were. You can find hundreds of pages that she wrote trying to find common patterns, uh, repetitions, associate um, sounds with certain situation, basically translate the languages of, of whale. And there are a lot of things that have been happening ever since. And we now know um, a lot more about whale sounds. We know that they speak dialects. There are whales in a certain part of the Pacific that speak differently from whales in other parts or in other oceans. Um, an interesting story that I heard from a scientist was that there was a, a song recorded from a whale in the South Pacific somewhere. And uh, um, that song basically propagated through the ocean. It went viral. They really think that it was a song, um, not a way to communicate something. And what they thought it was that really the song became viral. It was a beautiful haunting song that was uh, copied and reproduced by other whales throughout the ocean basically became extremely popular. And this is, um, um, I think my, it's going to be my, my last sound slide. Um, I'm not sure whether you can guess what kind of sounds we're, we're listening to. Maybe you can take a guess before I tell you. Bats. Anyone wants exactly bats. yes. This are bats. And so I would have said when I first listened to it, they were I thought they were birds. Um and and this is um, an incredible study. Um I think it was done in a cave in Romania uh, by a scientist who went there and he tagged um thousands of bats with microphones. Um he also had infrared cameras, and basically again, what he did using AI and machine learning tool, he correlated um, behavior of the bats uh, with the sounds they produce. Um, and, you know, you may walk in there and and uh, uh, and think, you know, yeah, these bats are just emitting, uttering some random sounds. But when you do this kind of work, you realize the information content present in what they're singing. Um, and uh, uh, it's it's quite unbelievable what they figure out. They figure out that they have gender in their language. They have male and female gender in their expression. They figure out that they have some expressions that they were some sound sequences they use when they hold a grudge against other bats. Um, they figure, they, they, they basically understood a specific sound sequence that bats use when they're offering uh, sex in exchange for food. And, and one of the cutest things that I've heard from, 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 from that line of research is that they realized that once they interpreted bat language, they realized that mother bats teach baby bats bat words by babbling slowly these words. And uh, basically the same way we do. Um, and, and I think it, it's really fascinating, eye-opening. Um, and when I look at, at this, um, you know, this results, and I, I think there are several important questions that scientists and all of us need to answer. I mean, the first one to me has a very clear answer. And I do see a lot of anthropocentrism in this, like a lot of people, and I see it still written many places, man is the only animal capable of language. Um, I think this is really a very short-sighted view. It reminds me of people who used to say, you know, Earth is at the center of the universe and then uh, Earth is the only planet. And, and now we know there are as many planets as stars and it's pretty clear that there is life out there. Um, to think that we have the exclusivity on languages is, uh, is something sort of very, again, anthropocentric that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's pretty clear that species like dolphins are even capable of symbolic language. Um, and uh, it's, um, you know, it, it, it is clear to me, we may redefine what language means, but if you listen to what these bats are saying, there are emotions and drama and communication and information. So yeah, I do think that we are not the only species that speak languages. 
And, and looking at all of this research, as I said, all of the scientists are motivated by the desire to defend the environment, to do something, to use the sounds, to act in some way. Um, and they are deciphering sounds. They are starting to understand bat language. They're starting to understand elephant language. Um, and sometimes even sort of bits of plant sounds, their, their meaning and their purpose. Um, and some scientists think that we're very close to having a Google Translate for for animal languages. And uh, what, you know, there are a lot of questions associated with that. Of course, if that's in the hand of a number of scientists who do it for protection purposes, it's one thing. If it goes into the end of people who want to, um, you know, hunt whales or destroy the environment or help them, you know, in their poaching activities, uh, I think that's a whole other story. Um, so um, it's pretty clear that interspecies communication is possible. The question is, mm -hmm. what should we do with that? Is that ethical? What rules should we start thinking about to sort of make sure that it's not used to the detriment of our planet? And I'll, I'll stop here. And thank you so much, Richard, for having me. It was, a, it was a great pleasure and great pleasure to listen to all of your works and stories. Matteo, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, just to move quickly now, we have about uh, just under 20 minutes. We have 15, 20 minutes. So a very brief introduction to John Lifton, who lives in Telluride. John is a dear longtime friend, part of the, he and his wife Pamela were part of the London Arts Lab in the early 70s. And, uh, and he created a project in uh, the early mid 70s called Green Music. Uh, which I, th I I thought should be highlighted here is uh, approximately 50 years ago. And uh, so, uh, John Lifton, tell us a bit about yourself, about Green Music, anything relative to this program, and then we'll move into a discussion. Thanks, Richard. Um, I, I'm an architect by training. Um, I was very interested when I was young in, in computing, and how it was going to change the world. And thinking about um, architecture and, and computing and in, intelligence in buildings, um, I became very interested in interaction that people could have in their lives with, with buildings. That was where my interest started. And I thought a way to explore that was um, to set up environments where people's behavior altered what was going on in the space in some manner so that they had some, some feedback between them and the environment they were in. And the first works I did were projection systems that changed with sound. Um, and they were projections often with images which were broken up in various ways, like going through... Um, going through crystals that were mounted um, on motors and things so that the, the image was split into pieces and the bits moved around according to the sound that they heard or people's movements. Um, and then I started going the other way and I, I had um, music that was produced um, from people's movements. The movements made, you could, you could dance and you would get music to go along with it. It was just coming from your movement. And this was this was in the mid 60s, mid to late 60s, I was doing this. Um, and then I had the thought, and I think it was in um, 1971 or 72, that uh, a, a, a wonderful thing would be to do this with plants and try and make sound that gave people um, a perceptual analogy of what the what the world was like to plants, the amount of changing information that was going on that, that the plants were, were dealing with. Um, and it was called Green Music, but, but I'd say that the, it was really more like a sound piece than a music piece. Um, and that was because I didn't want it to be like run, getting signals from plants and sticking them into regular synthesizers and doing things where um, rhythms were already established and scales of pitch were established. I wanted, I wanted to do something
What's happened here? Looks like he got disconnected, Richard. Yeah, it looks like he got disconnected. So Sound if good. everybody turns on their sound or turns it on and off as required. And uh, I don't want, I don't think I need to even moderate this discussion. I think there may be some just immediate uh, questions, answers, interactions among people. Uh, I'll just provoke Scott to start. Any thoughts, Any anything you want to ask anybody or talk about the tech, the, the uh, ethics? Uh... <laughs> Wow, you're really putting me on the spot. I, I just kind of want to throw out, like, it, maybe it's my uh, my little soapbox here, but Matteo kind of referenced it for sure as the anthropocentric view of the world. And looking at Ken's pre presentation, who's doing work with human interaction, and also um, want to tie in um, Timothy and Reiko's work with going out to the bogs and listening to nature. Is what? How do we? What are your thoughts on just? the reality that humans are so human centric and how do we shift that perspective into more of a natural kind of um, interaction? Maybe I'll uh, jump in and say that that's actually um, in terms of what Matteo was referencing specifically, that's probably one of the reasons I'm most excited about artificial intelligence right now in particular is the ability to start to decode cetacean languages, to start to look at very large data sets and what that may tell us about living systems, because I do agree, and probably most of you would feel the same that we as humans have a tendency to imagine that we're you know, the supreme, all brilliant beings and we don't acknowledge the intelligence which is in natural living systems like plants, which I believe are conscious and insects and animals. So, you know, that would be my response. Mm -hmm. Matteo? Well, I feel that there is a strange, uh, yeah, it's on one hand, it's inevitable we're humans. So we can only think, uh, you know, as humans, but I still see so much um, of this anthropocentrism in, 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 in everything. There was a paper I read recently, it was a recent one, which basically was trying to, to prove that a number of animal species don't really have language. And, and the way they do it is they use a machine learning, they use machine learning themselves, and they, they, they basically would, would, how they analyze the languages, they, they basically see common structure and they see how the structure can be connected in a network. And basically what they found for these animals is that it's not the same that you would get from a human language. And they concluded this, they were very sort of assertive in the way they stated that, that these animals don't have a language. And then um, you look at, you know, some of the scientists, for instance, those working on whales, they think that whales, first of all, they perceive themselves through their sounds and through their language, not through visual information as we do. And some of them suspect that the sound, um, they, they, their language is actually encoded in 3D holograms. So it's not just, you know, the frequency that goes up and down, but it's how it's distributed in the sort of giant wave that they send out. So good luck deciphering that language and, and telling, you know, oh, this doesn't have the structure that you need and the grammar that you need to be able to call it a language. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. I think, you know, the, the, there should be an effort by, by a lot of people, scientists, artists, communicators, and sort of dismantling this kind of uniqueness that start, you know, it's it starts being as ridiculous as saying that the earth is center of the universe. <laughs> I want to just uh, welcome John back. Are you there? Thank you. <laughs> good, good. good. So uh, I don't know if you want to just uh, very quickly, uh, just in like three, two, three minutes, uh, can you uh, finish what you had started about green music? Yeah. Well, green green music made made music made sound from uh, a group of six plants. Um, and the processing that I used was partly analog and partly digital, digital, but it was mostly those things were interconnected in unusual ways um, because they, it was uh, one 
equipment was very expensive back then, so one had to largely make one's own to do any of these things. And I, I was just mentioning one thing that I was, I was trying to, to make a, a different kind of sound to listen to. Uh, and so I had the, these sets of oscillators that made very pure sine waves, and they were digitally interconnected and phase locked so that they would be multiples of, a, of one frequency. That is, that you'd start with one oscillator would be the fundamental, and then you'd have one that was locked at two times the frequency, another at three, another at four, whatever. So what you could do then is have the, the pitch of this whole set is, is controlled with a, a single system. Um, but the, the uh, volume of each overtone is then controlled separately. So what you're putting together is a sound where the timbral structure of it is changing continuously from the signals that are coming from the plaques. Um, so it doesn't fit into one's categories of listening for what, what instruments are like or, or, or what conventional musical sound is like. It was a very different kind of sound. Um, and I thought that would help people realize that the, the world that's going on for plants formally isn't like a model of our world. And that's exactly the same conversation I came back into that you're, that you're, you're talking about, you know, the, the nature of language and, and how language seems to evolve in nature at a much lower level or earlier level, I should say, rather than lower probably than, than we've tended to think in the past. And that's incredibly interesting and exciting. And, and it opens up this vast, um, spectrum of, of, of other ways we can be communicating and, and connecting with nature and understanding um, how other life forms live and work and perceive things. And I, I think that has, has to be a, a huge potential. I may jump in really quickly and like to mention um, an amazing group of researchers uh, that some of you may have heard about. It's called Interspecies Internet or Interspecies IO. And I yeah. uh, posted, um, I actually posted a link to it in the chat. And this is a group that um, gets together about once a month where they present, um, you know, various researchers looking at interspecies communication. Just an absolutely fascinating group. They also have a YouTube channel and um, they tape record all, or rather they record all of the uh, lectures which could be found on YouTube. So if you just Google interspecies IO and YouTube, you'll find just the most amazing talks. People like Karen Baker, um, you know, just authors writing about um, communication with whales, with dolphins and all the research surrounding it. It's a spectacular group. And I'll just toot my own horn real quickly before we wind this up. And also uh, being one of the elders here uh, uh, back in the 70s, I, I was exploring really the basics of information, which was uh, signal uh, and send and receive and sense and communicate in a number of different ways. And that involved uh, using sensors as well as just interacting with different species. Uh, I spent 10 years around Coco, the signing gorilla, and other uh, gorillas and uh, uh, orcas and dolphins and harbor seals uh, from uh, British Columbia down to Baja. And, uh, and with John Lifton and separately worked on the Secret Life of Plants feature film doing plant sensing, which was a, uh, went beyond uh, a little bit beyond and a little behind green music <laughs> and, yeah. and included uh, human physiological sensing as well. Um, and so, I mean, there's a, a wonderful long tradition of learning and, and doing in this arena uh, and being some of us, uh, like those of us on the screen here, being extremely sensitive and curious uh, to explore these areas, to be part, actually be a part of the world of intercommunication uh, and, uh, and, and really think even beyond the technology of, 
uh, the sensor technology and so on, and the analysis of signals and so on, just to be around those environments as Tim and Reiko are doing, uh, or some of the others of us, really living amid the richness of, uh, of the diversity of life uh, and recognizing that all living things sense, communicate, and as they reproduce, that knowledge, that wisdom, that information is reproduced as well. There's an evolution, uh, not just to our physical development, but to our sensory and, uh, you know, uh, communicative development over time. We've evolved in many ways because we are tuning organisms. Uh, like all living things, we're in tune with the wealth of information and radiation that surrounds us. Uh, you know, some people refer to the noosphere uh, uh, as part of the biosphere or overlaying the biosphere. Uh, but yeah, the whole biosphere is alive and communicative. Uh, and, and that's a just wondrous phenomenon. Uh, and as artists and as scientists, it's it's a rich arena to be playing in and attempting attempting to understand and and also share. So I want to thank everybody on this call. Anybody have any last thoughts or comments before we say thank you and uh, wind this up? I also want to say tomorrow we have two uh, uh, Leonardo Laser Zoom uh, uh, sessions. One on the economics of information, at least some, some aspects of that. It's a very broad area, but how do we value information uh, in its various forms? And uh, there's also tomorrow uh, a special connection with uh, SIGGRAPH, the Computer Graphics Conference that's going on in Denver as we speak. And uh, four remarkable individuals are gonna join us for uh, the laser zoom tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. This was a great session. Uh, I, I'm really curious, as these all get recorded, are, are, are recorded and will be posted online, I think they're going to, over time, get a lot of viewership. Thank you. I just want to invite everybody, if you, start, if, you, if you happen to be in New York, please drop a line. I'd like to meet you in person. Um, we ran this Science and Arts Center called New Sphere Art, so that's connected to the new sphere that Richard is talking about. And um, I also uh, want to mention there is a, a center. I'm not involved with it. I sometimes have done things with them, but Biobat, have you heard of that? Um, yes, in Manhattan. A, it, in Brooklyn. In, um, in Brooklyn, yeah, I went there just yeah. recently. Yeah. It's quite, quite amazing. They've got uh, quite a f f new facility. Yeah, yeah, they have a new facility. They're very resourceful. They they yeah. are they send some pieces of art to the International Space Station. You need some connections to do that. Um, and I I would see all of your artwork and all of your projects being featured there at some point. And uh, so just look at them up. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's an incredibly an open minded place. And yes. um, as I said, very resourceful and very very high quality. Yeah. So Matteo, uh, Matteo, is there going to be a special uh, a special issue of Physics Magazine dealing with some of this? <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll I'll think about that. Yeah, uh, I I will rewatch the Physics session. Uh, that was a tough one, though, <laughs> compared to yeah, this it was. one in that terms was. of communication. I mean, this you guys are great communicator. They want they, that one was really um, very high level physics. <laughs> <laughs> I'll watch that again and and see if I can write an arts and culture or something. <laughs> But yeah, I think I think there's going to be a lot of follow up about, among uh, a number of us uh, beyond this little uh, Zoom here. So I look forward to seeing everybody uh, over over time uh, as we say goodbye right now. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. So good to see you, Scott, Thank Tim, you. Rico. You, Scott. Great to meet you, everybody. John and Mateo. Thank you, Richard. So grateful. Amazing. Yeah. Yes. Kumbawa, Rico. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah.